Welcome in folks, got a four piece for you here today, four videos up to react to first one up here, NVIDIA stock. NVIDIA has a lot of gas in the tank, a lot of upside. We're gonna go ahead and react to this one. I wanna share my opinions and perspectives on that one. Do I think there's still major upside for NVIDIA here? Uh, then we're gonna react to this one. NVIDIA has three to five years of AI dominance ahead. I'm looking forward to reacting that one, sharing my opinions and perspectives there. Then we're gonna get into this one. Expect the economy to stagnate over the second half of 2024. Looking forward to reacting to that one. And then the last one up here, the bunch, Market Rally does not need rate cut to continue its upward momentum. That one, JP Morgan, I'm looking really forward to reacting to that one. Appreciate y'all joining me as always for this four piece here today. All I ask in return, take three seconds out of your day, hit that like button down there, the thumbs up button, and make sure you're subscribed here to the channel. I think we're at 45,000 600 plus subscribers. So appreciate each and every one of you for being here. The pinned comment down there today, I'll put 1000xstocks.com, which check it out, guys. Check it out, baby. We got it. We've got all the new metrics for the compare category and exactly how I laid out. We've got all the mandatory metrics, trailing 12 month P, forward P, two year forward P, trailing 12 month EPS, current year expected EPS, next year expected EPS growth. Oh man, I love it. I love it. We got it all laid out now at this point in time. So yeah, that'll be pinned comment down there if you're looking to apply for access to 1000xstocks.com. We also have conference calls up and rolling and then uh, transcripts of conference calls as well. Well, let's go ahead and get into this. Amid news that the FTC and DOJ are set to open antitrust probes into NVIDIA, Microsoft, and OpenAI to investigate their dominance in the artificial intelligence industry. This happening as NVIDIA... They're doing too much. I'll be honest. Uh, FTC, the FTC, DOJ, they got too much going on. Um, you got to understand how much of a task force it takes to just really look in depth into one of these companies. They're trying to go after all these big techs now at this point in time. They're doing too much. They're going to spread themselves too thin. $3 trillion in market cap yesterday and ahead of the company's 10 for one forward stock split that's going into effect tomorrow after the close. Joining us now to discuss is Ben Reitzis from Melius Research. Ben, it's great to have you on. Um, we saw, okay. Stock came under pressure today. We saw some selling. However, we did see an incredible run-up post-earnings last month uh, ahead of this. So I do want to get your thoughts first on these antitrust headlines, these reports, whether there is any concern to be had or any risk to be had uh, to the stock, especially as it trades at these levels right now. You know, I'm still trying to get my head around this antitrust the thing you know these are hard for an analyst to opine on but I'm, I'm just wondering what they're thinking here i mean are they mad at nvidia for figuring out the world was going in this direction before anyone else <laughs> inventing the best chips innovating uh changing the world um you know we'll just have to see what happens here but uh you know the doj under this administration is probably investigating um all my mega caps that are in the mag seven in some way, shape, or form, and yeah. we, we're focusing on the fundamentals. Um, we have to deal with this with Google. We have to deal with this with Apple. You know, now Microsoft and Nvidia, which are all under my coverage. And I think by focusing on the fundamentals, we're going to be in the right place. Um, I'm not really sure with Nvidia what they can really say because, you know, you're going to maybe you got to blame some of the competitors for just not seeing the GPU market like Jensen did, you know, several you know decades ago mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, I, I just focus on the fundamentals, guys. Okay. So stock's down 1% today. It's up 10% just since the start of this week. Uh, do you buy on the dip, especially as we do look ahead to... So as a NVIDIA shareholder, do I think there's regulatory risk here with the, the government, right? So my opinion is no, no, no. Um, I, I don't see anything that looks like that. I'm like, oh boy, this could be that problematic for, for NVIDIA. No. I would be a little worried. I would be a little concerned about Apple. I'd be slightly concerned if I was a Google shareholder. Uh, but mainly Apple is the one I would be mainly concerned about because of their app store and kind of locking people into the ecosystem. The whole messaging not really working uh, very well, obviously, with, with um, other folks as in like Android, right? And so I would have some question marks about Apple, but in terms of NVIDIA, 0% worried. 0% worried. And honestly, I'm less worried for all these big techs now because like I said, these guys are spreading themselves too thin. You understand when you go against one of these big massive companies and you wanna to try to launch an investigation, you gotta understand 
you're going to be dealing with the creme de la creme lawyers. Lawyers that are better than whatever the government has. You know why they're better than whatever the government has? They make a whole lot more money than the government lawyers, okay? And so they're going to be a tier above, if not several tiers above. So you're already fighting a losing battle there, right, if you're the government. And then you're trying to try to fight several of these guys at the same time and do like you're not going to be able to do proper investigations. You need to focus in on just one of the big dogs. If you want to focus in on Apple, Apple better take your entire task force up or a huge portion of that, right? And if then you want to try to go after this company, this, uh, you spread yourself too thin. You're not going to be able to accomplish anything you really want to accomplish out there. So I'll say that. Stock split. Well, we you know we really feel that. This is obviously the closest, this is the next Apple. We were lucky enough to be an analyst covering Apple and watching them create an ecosystem where they did a full stack solution basically and allowed you to monetize a whole app ecosystem. This is the AI version of that and that's what they're doing. They are creating a solution that's turnkey to allow you to monetize AI and that hopefully is ahead of us and we just feel if, if you believe in AI and you believe it's going to be monetized by the world's largest custom uh, companies and then filter down, this is the way to play it. Uh, we've been pretty vocal about $45 and earnings power should be demonstrated within an investable time frame. Uh, it's well below 30 times that even at today's valuation. So uh, we have some faith, Jensen, here in the crew. Ben, a year ago, it was tempting to say, hey, NVIDIA's had a nice run. It looks like um, maybe it's expensive. Microsoft has had a nice run. Maybe we should look for uh, other names that are going to benefit from AI that haven't, like Intel, like IBM. Now, you continued to like uh, NVIDIA, but, but you've also liked Intel and IBM. Intel really hasn't done well. IBM hasn't done great. What's the lesson in that? And what are the kinds of catalysts that would cause some of these uh, second or third tier players to do better? Or, or might they just not? Well, you know, Intel and IBM did great last year. Both have had a pullback. Uh, Intel was up 93% last year. I'm not apologizing for that. <laughs> um, I think that uh, IBM also had a really good run. I think that what we need to do is um, as we move to more of the inferencing phase and we need to enjoy AI, more folks can benefit. That's been our call this year. Uh, so in the PC market, uh, another name that we've been talking about quite a bit is Dell, which has recently pulled back. That's one way to play it. Who also sells the servers. Um, but we think that a whole, you know, we haven't even got started here yet. I mean, we're just getting Copilot Plus PCs. We're just seeing AI get into industry. So once we get going and models go into production and we actually have more apps, then a lot more folks can benefit. Right now, okay. these guys are taking all the oxygen out of the room. Finally, if the economy overall continues to slow, it seems like if the AI spend is going to continue, they're going to have to be more and more pockets that companies within themselves are going to have to pick to pay for that. Does that cause you to be less bullish about some other area because you expect AI to continue to be strong? Good question. Well, a couple months ago, we wrote a piece called AI is Eating Software, and we didn't realize <laughs> that it would all come together and within two months. And, you know, you really are seeing a once in a lifetime, in my opinion, and we're really in the early innings, shift towards the picks and shovels, not just semis, but also good old fashioned hardware. If we're indeed moving to AI factories where software is uh, produced on the fly, a lot of the equipment that we've left for dead is gonna have a new life, not only in the cloud, but even trickle onto on-prem. And so that's been our big call, probably our seminal moment as an analyst, uh, again, in this second leg of my career. And, and it, we're really you know, feeling like we're really just on the precipice of what's gonna take place. Okay. If we are standing up factories for software, a lot of things are gonna change. Uh, and NVIDIA, of course, is, is, is the horse. You know, what's interesting is this price target there is only 1250. You know, I, I thought that was kind of interesting because, I mean, basically on a split adjusted basis as of this upcoming week, they'll be $125, right? I mean, if NVIDIA just has a decent week this upcoming week, he'll already pass up his price target, right? So I think that's pretty interesting because it's, it's funny because some of these folks are really bullish on NVIDIA, but then you look at their price targets 
And they're like, why, like, why are your price targets not higher? The man even made a case that Nvidia is not richly valued right now. He talked about valuation, right? And yet he's got a, a 1250 price target. That's like almost no upside from here, right? Very minuscule upside. Why not go raise your price target, right? And it just seems like a lot of these guys have been uh, scared to raise price targets, and that's why they've all been way too low, right? And that's why many, many, many months ago, I was telling you guys, watch, NVIDIA is going to hit 1,000, and it's going to head to 1,200, and then we're going to hit 1,500, and don't be surprised if when the top, top hits, don't be surprised if it gets close to 2,000, right, which would be close to, uh, you know, 200 on a split-adjusted basis before it's all said and done. So, you know, we'll see how it all shakes out, but... Um, yeah, the, these guys are, when, when it comes to their price targets, they're, st they're too bearish. You know, when it comes to their commentary, they sound ultra bullish. And then you look at their price targets, like, dang, man, this seems actually bearish, right? NVIDIA has three to five years of AI dominance ahead. The company has tripled in value in about a year. Is this growth sustainable as investors continue to reward the AI hype? Here with more, we've got Doug Clinton, Deepwater Asset Management Managing Partner here. All right, so let's start there. Is it sustainable? I think it is sustainable and you know it always sounds smart to ask the question you know when will this be over you look at the hockey stick that you just described brad it feels a little scary it looks a little scary on the chart but i think the reality is this we are in inning three or four of this ai bull market i think that we are still early as uncomfortable as that sounds and maybe feels but i think it's going to feel uncomfortable all the way until we get to eventually being in a true AI bubble, which we think is kind of the culmination of this bull market. And then people will stop talking about valuation altogether. So that, that's the odd sort of counterintuitive reality is we're worried right now that things might be over. It's probably not over. When we stop worrying, that's when you should start worrying. And also, Doug, just taking a step back, we also have the stock split that's going to take place or be effective um, after the end of the trading day tomorrow. I guess when we just talk about some of that near-term excitement, that buildup that we've seen within AI, how big of a driver do you see that? It's probably just going to be a very brief a blip here, or a move bump to the upside, but how big of a driver do you see that in terms of just the narrative and excitement surrounding AI? I think the stock split for NVIDIA, as you said, Sean, I think that will just be kind of a blip here. Obviously, that gets certain people excited. Mentally, you see a lower stock price and people feel like it may be cheaper, even though it's not. Mm -hmm. I think the reality, though, with NVIDIA is they continue to show business momentum. I think that's really what is the most exciting piece of the entire story is that despite all of us worrying that eventually this mm -hmm. demand for chips will slow down, we haven't really seen that slowdown happen yet, and it may take longer to slow down than we think. That's kind of the the new opinion that I think the street might think about. And so there's going to be a, a moment. I would say this moment's probably coming in the next, I would say, three quarters, if I had to guess. And it's going to be a very negative moment for NVIDIA stock. Very, very negative moment. The moment, what's going to happen, and like I said, I think this will probably happen in the next three quarters, and the stock's going to move down massively after this, is... NVIDIA is going to report a quarter, and the beats are going to be very small, and they might not raise guidance, or if they do, it's a very small amount. And that's going to be a moment where everybody takes a step back and freaks out, because <laughs> then they're going to say, it's here. The moment we've all been dreading, it's here. Uh, NVIDIA's business is you know, starting to fall apart. Now, that might not be true, by the way, in terms of their business falling apart. It will just be a view of oh, we're starting to reach a top in this big AI chip boom. And once again, that might not be true, but people are going to freak out about it. Because once, because it, everybody's gotten so used to NVIDIA destroying their past quarter numbers, up in guidance in a $1 billion plus dollar way, that whenever that doesn't happen, and like I said, it'll probably happen in the next three quarters, in one of those three quarters, right? Everybody's going to flip their flapjacks and freak out. And so that's going to be a moment. And where it's going to happen, and uh, you know, it's no guarantee, but I think there's a pretty high probability it's going to happen, and that's going to be a big downward move for Nvidia stock at that moment. So that's going to be interesting, right? And then the other big moment down for the stock, if you're ever thinking about when does the stock move down, right? Because really, Nvidia just has nothing but upward momentum until that happens, or 
The other scenario, and this you might have to wait till late in 2025 or maybe even 2026, when they have a quarter where on a sequential basis our revenue actually goes down. That will be a very negative moment. Or they're projecting on a sequential basis revenue to go down. That will be an extremely negative moment for the stock. But that might not be till late 2025. That might not even be till 2026 in regards to that. So I wouldn't worry about that as much. But those are really the only two major negative things for NVIDIA stock. Everything else is kind of green shoots, positivity, um, kind of upward momentum there. But those two things are the, the scary ones. And the first one, that will probably come, I would say, in the next the next three quarters. The other one, you probably in the next, I would say, seven or eight quarters. That one might push out further. We're thinking about what the street is going to continue to rally on the back of here. I mean, we just laid out the entirety of the companies that are really within this three trillion dollar conversation. And for NVIDIA, it's really been the artificial intelligence demand that they continue to cite and how people are essentially looking at them as this de facto AI play. What about the market share that they need to retain in order to continue to maintain this type of sentiment in the street? I think that's the right question going forward. I mean, right now, from a market share perspective, they likely have 80 to 90 percent of accelerated compute market share, market share for chips that do power this AI revolution. And I think going forward, they probably need to maintain share in that realm. So the question really is, number one, can AI companies, companies that are building these models like Google, like OpenAI with their partnership with Microsoft, can they eventually generate revenue that makes this investment justified? That's an outstanding question. I think they will. It may take longer than investors hope, but I think they will. The second question to your point is, can NVIDIA maintain its dominant position providing the brains to these artificial intelligence models. And I think they can for the next three to five years. I do think that we should pay attention to all of the hyperscalers building their own silicon. There is going to be competition out there, but I still think at least for the next three years, NVIDIA is going to be the go-to company. Doug, I was just out at uh, Bank of America's Global Tech Conference uh, earlier this week in San Francisco, and I was talking to some executives, the new Nix uh, CEO, uh, Rajiv Ramaswamy was one of them. We also, I was also speaking with the founder of Pure Storage, and, and they've raised that issue that you were just bringing up, right, just in terms of how realistic maybe these timelines are until we see some real return when it comes to some of those secondary players. I'm curious if you think that the market almost needs a reality check at this point and maybe the excitement in some of these plays maybe not nvidia and certainly doesn't seem like nvidia but when we talk about some of those secondary plays has it gotten a little ahead of itself at this point i think it depends on your timeline and i when you look at sort of these technologically driven booms they're never purely up and to the right when you zoom out they always look like they are but when you live through it day to day and week to week there are pullbacks. I mean, even NVIDIA had a 20% pullback earlier this year. That's painful if you bought the stock at the top. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we do see some of those right sizings, temporary right sizings, you know, in the next three, six months, as investors do think about how do revenues ultimately translate. And I think the story with emerging technology is often the same, which is it usually does take a little bit longer than everybody hopes to generate meaningful revenue. But once that revenue comes, it's often bigger than people even imagine. I think that's probably going to be the case for AI, too. Just while we have you here, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wong talked about demand for the company's chips in an exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance. This came after the company's first quarter results last month. I want to play for you a clip of what he had to say. Copper demand grew throughout this quarter after we announced Blackwell. And so that kind of tells you how much demand there is out there. People want to deploy these data centers right now. They want to put our GPUs to work right now and start making money and start saving money. And so so that that demand is just so strong. Do you have an assessment of within these data centers, the makeup or the total number of chips that we could even potentially see some of these data centers grow out to as we're looking for even more demand that is going to be needed well not needed but even more that is going to be asked of the chips within the data centers because of generative ai it's a big number, and the reality is you can you can look at several data points. I mean, XAI, for example, a company that Deepwater actually just invested in recently, Elon Musk has talked about needing 100,000 of NVIDIA's top-end AI accelerator chips 
uh, to build the supercomputer that they want to build. That's three to four billion dollars of capex there from a single customer, and obviously that's just one data center, that's one supercomputer. They will continue to build more infrastructure over time, um, and I think you can look at the same thing for many of the other hyperscalers. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of chips that are needed there, and maybe even if you expand out, you look at sovereign nations that are looking at AI. You look at industry that are thinking about how to apply AI. The demand for the chips could scale into the millions. Yeah, so right now, right, right now all these big tech companies, all these tech companies in general, they're, they're, it's very important everybody understands this. Right now they're only looking at the positives. They're only thinking about how much they can grow their business and do this and do that, right? And so they're willing to spend pretty much, you know, almost unlimited amount of money on these chips with NVIDIA right now, right? And so that's great for NVIDIA for this year and for next year. But the problem is... A lot of these companies need to really start to see good inflections in regards to their business models when it comes to actually making money this year and into 2025 if they're going to keep spending as aggressively as they have in 2026 and 2027. So it's just important everybody understands it because let's say let's say end use cases are not really um, all that exciting for AI over the you know for the remainder of this year and into 2025. Then essentially a lot of these big techs will start cutting back significantly on how many chips they're ordering, right? Which will obviously very negatively affect NVIDIA starting in 2026 and into 2027, right? So just a little food for thought in regards to that. Now, if the end user, um, let's call it rapidly uses these AI products over this next year or two, then NVIDIA can keep pumping out these orders and keep, you know, these, these big techs will keep spending because they're going to get the return on investment there. But you know, if they are not really seeing a, a very good ROI or much of an ROI or interest next year or the year after, then at that point in time, especially if they had any sort of real weakness on their stock price. So just a little food for thought in regards to that, but it can work either way. Expect the economy to stagnate over the second half of 2024. And Michelle, we've already, I didn't say everything uh, that you're thinking, but I, I did, uh, <laughs> did mention a couple of things. So I th think you're a little below that. You're, you're at 185. Uh, We're right at 190. So oh, you are, just, you're at 190. You're above then. And it maybe the consensus. Yes, slightly. Is, and it was, this is versus 175 last time. And you point out down from what was the average in the first quarter, quite a bit higher. It was in the twos. <laughs> Yes, year to date, we're running 246,000, you know, in uh, payroll gains per month. So this would be a solid number, but slower than what we've seen, slower than what we saw in the second half of last year. The trend is moving in the direction the Fed would like to see. It's probably got further to go. You talked about the fact we do expect the numbers will continue to weaken uh, as we move over the remainder of the year. In general, the economy, we think, will slow, really pretty much stagnate um, over the second half of 2024. Moving the Fed's way. Well, they'd that's, like to see it moderate, implying, right? Right. Well, I don't know. That's just implying that this means cooler inflation data. And I don't know. It is, is it like night follows day? I don't, it's, a, it's, weird to try <laughs> to, it's weird to try to cause higher uh, unemployment. Exactly. Although, I, I mean, I, I don't think the Fed is necessarily trying to, to force the economy into a recession, but they don't want the economy to continue to grow at, at such a rapid pace and an above trend rate that you, you really can't get the inflation rate back to target. And they, they do make the connection that a strong job market will mean stronger wage growth, which will keep you know, inflation elevated. So to see employment easing back a bit, and more importantly, to see the earnings numbers, wages numbers, slowing from, you know, what had been 4% plus, now we think it's, you know, it moved to 3.9%. To see some of the, of the uh, you know, boil coming off in terms of the wage numbers will give the Fed confidence that, you know, in terms of everything aligning for inflation to move back to two percent, you know that won't that won't be something that keeps the inflation elevated. Uh, I, I surmise from what you're expecting in the second half that you think that we are in restricted territory. So you expect 160, 160,000 in the second quarter, and then a sharp slowdown from that in the second half in jobs. Yeah. 
Yes, because, you know, we do think that, it, you know, where the, the monetary posture is with the funds rate over, you know, 5%, that we are restricted. Um, and, and we do think that that is having an impact and weighing on the economy. Although, you know, George, you were talking about, it isn't easy to, to find the strong evidence of that, particularly when it comes to the labor market. Although some of the underlying data, uh, you know, Everybody's talking about, of course, the number of, of job vacancies or job openings that have come off. You've you noted the very modest uptick in, uh, in claims. So small business surveys have suggested hiring plans have, uh, have you know, have eased as, as I think companies have gotten more concerned about the outlook. So there are signs of things slowing that the that the level of rates is having an impact on the economy. And by the second half of this year, as I said, we expect that. GDP growth will be pretty close to flat. You know, we have gains wow. of around a half a percent after running, you know, There's three no and a half to four percent um, over the last, uh, you know, two quarters. Given that in itself would feel like a huge recession. The ECB, there's a piece in the journal today about the job the Federal Reserve won't do, and that's to try to stabilize, uh, you know, currency fluctuations and, and foreign exchange. Uh, this just made it worse uh, this week. In, in, in Asia, a strong dollar has already uh, been sort of the story of the year, according to this. What, what do you think this this gentleman who wrote this? It says it, he'd like better coordination. What is he saying? Is he saying it's it's our job uh, if we want to keep currency stable to just follow the ECB, whether it makes sense for yeah. us or not? Yeah. It, 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 That's it, ridiculous. We're going to see more aggressive Fed rate cutting in 2025 that'll probably outpace both the ECB and the BOE. And, and so our expectation actually is, is that, you know, the dollar, you know, in 2025 will, will strengthen. I think the other thing we don't have to get into it is, of course, there's a lot of mixed views about the outcome of the election and what that might mean for the dollar. Well, you haven't said anything that, that would cause anyone to feel uncomfortable with the stock market at, at these levels. And, and uh, th that's been one, I mean, the, I don't know about the, the underlying economy itself, but there's certainly been a lot of interest in financial assets and meme stocks and Bitcoin. So in, <laughs> in that regard, it doesn't really look like we've been that restrictive. But everything you just said, it almost sounds like Goldilocks to me, Michelle. I don't know about that, man. I don't know about that whole, oh, is, you know, all this untrust on all the meme stocks and, and crypto. Okay, um, but it's mainly at the top, right? But, I mean, at the end of the day, like, look at these stocks. I mean, you know, GME was, like, a billion dollars. No, it wasn't that much. Um, you know, 80s back then, you know, 60s. And is it 28? Okay, you know, cool, but that's still, like, nothing. Nothing compared to where where it used to be at, right? What about AMC, another meme stock, right? You know, that one was, oh, my gosh, on a split-adjusted basis. Oh my gosh, it was in the 300 since four bucks today. So, yeah, uh, you know, I just don't agree with, with that. Bitcoin's doing tremendous, right? Uh, the, the, you can't make an argument against that. But remember, Bitcoin, it's the ETFs went through this year, right? And so it's just a huge, huge moment. Plus you had, what, the halving of Bitcoin, which is always an exciting moment for Bitcoin in general, right? And the NASDAQ's doing very well. And, the, and Bitcoin can very often act like a call option on the NASDAQ, right? If the NASDAQ does very well, Bitcoin does very well. If the NASDAQ does very bad, Bitcoin does very bad, right? So I think you've got a lot of different factors there. Soft landing, soft landing. We get some cuts eventually, not too early. Um, things are not too hot, not too cold. Everything you see, you're in a really good mood. Is it Friday or is it donut yeah, day? Yeah, no, it, what is it? Um, it's donut day. <laughs> it's Friday. You know, in the sense that we are not looking at a hard landing, inflation is, is moving lower. It, it is an environment right now that looks pretty well, you know, supportive for financial assets. Uh, of course, you know, one of the expectations is that as interest, as the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, market rates will, will move lower. And I guess that's something that we need to see. Uh, right now, you can see even in the last few weeks, we've seen 10-year uh, Treasury yields moving lower, expectations about the economy cooling, giving the Fed room to cut rates. 
you know, the, the question is whether or not we can get lower market rates following the Fed down, particularly against a backdrop of still a very expansionary fiscal policy and a lot of, of Treasury supply that needs to be digested. And so one of the things as I look ahead is that the market may be, you know, may have to be surprised, if you will, by the fact that even if the economy slows, we are not going to see the Federal Reserve going back into an easy posture. It's just about the Fed maybe getting to neutral. And we may not see longer term yields fall as dramatically as we typically do when the economy slows because of the fact that there is still a good deal of supply to be digested. Yeah, I think it really depends on you know, if the economy just slows, right? Because slows isn't as scary. You talk about slows and it's kind of like, okay, you know, things just aren't booming, right? That's what you think about when you're just like, oh, the economy is a little slower right now. It's just, oh, it's not, it's not a great economy. It's not booming, right? But I think the difference happens if you go in to, oh, things aren't slowing, things are bad, <laughs> right? And that's when the Fed completely changes up their stance and kind of how they're acting. Market rally does not need rate cuts to continue upward momentum. Morgan Asset Management Portfolio Manager Phil Camparelli. Do we? Nope. This economy does not need a rate cut, <laughs> uh, Sarah. So in short, the Fed's dual mandate, as we know, full employment and price stability. We have a 4% unemployment rate for the last two years. And their goal for inflation is 2%, which they're probably not going to hit for a couple of years. Sarah, when you interviewed John Williams at the end of May, you know, we would agree with his take. And at the end of the day, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Does the benefit of a quarter-point rate hike outweigh no. the cost of a potential reignition of inflation based on easier financial conditions. And right now, this economy does not need a rate cut. I, I do believe that you should keep these meetings live as we go through this rest of this year. But today, we don't need a rate cut. So then let's talk about the valuation yeah. for the market. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't think that yeah. rate cuts are needed, then we do need earnings growth. Yes. We do need economic growth. Yeah. So where are we right now relative to what the valuation at record highs is suggesting? Yeah, good question. So we get this all the time because it's kind of like sticker shock if you look at just where the market's trading in terms of an all-time high. But, okay, we, we handicapped the economy at about a 2% real GDP growth, inflation at 3, Sarah. So that's a 5% nominal growth forecast. If you were to give me that, I'd be like, earnings are going to come through. And in the first quarter of this year, we kind of we kind of saw that. We got a little noise in April based on the rate movement. But the earnings story that we think is alive and well, payroll number today, listen, good news is good news when it comes to the labor market. Um, I think the wage story is something we have to keep an eye on. Wages ticked up to about 4.1%. But Sarah, the long-term average on wages over the last 50 years is 3.9. So we're kind of right on top of that. And this thing peaked in wages at 7% back in March of 2022 when the Fed went on their, their move higher. There was some discussion this week about tech having already gone through the pain of yeah. cutting back workforce yeah. and that, th that they're not set for any kind of margin compression in the, in the meantime now. Do you think that's true? Can yeah. they continue to lead as a result? Yeah, we think that's true, Carl. So that goes in the column of what are the particular sectors that don't need a rate cut? So Sarah, you asked, does the economy need a rate cut? We don't think it does, but we believe that things like small cap may or REITs or traditional fixed income may need a rate cut. But Carl, to your question about tech, you know, Apple did the, the largest buy back in the history of the universe and they didn't need a rate cut right? <laughs> so the free cash flow story we think is really important and 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 we continue to lean into kind of that's that. true but i don't know if he really got the point the gentleman was trying to make there carl quintanilla right uh big tech so they cut a lot of workforce we know about that right a lot of job cuts went through in 2022 and 2023 and then a little bit at the beginning of this year as well right and so Next time we have uh, their businesses kind of go a little south like they did in 2022, they don't have as as much to cut right now, and that's true. Uh, I don't. And so, if these businesses, if these companies' businesses went south because the economy went south, it's not like they have a kind of get out of jail free card like they had before in terms of they were just overhired and it was easy for them to cut 10,000 employees here or 20,000. I think now it's going to be a lot more difficult if they were to do any cuts right and so 
I think that is a risk factor to assess out there. But the good news is many of these big techs are not trading at rich valuations. Look at Meta, look at Google, right? Uh, it's not like the valuations are crazy on those stocks. Look at a Google McDougal, look at Meta, 24 Ford P's. Those companies have very nice growth rates expected for the, those companies, right? And so to be trading, or these companies are trading, is not crazy at all, right? NVIDIA obviously looks a lot richer, but the growth rates are NVIDIA. Look, at, I mean, they're self-explanatory. They're ridiculous, right? So... You know, those are things to kind of factor in. Apple has been trading a little rich, right? Let's compare Apple here. So Apple trading about 28.4 P roughly. But they should get back to nice growth next year. And the reason being is they should be launching a big iPhone. Um, when I say big iPhone, it's a bigger iPhone than they've ever had. And so I could see a nice... I could see a nice cycle in iPhone next year, along with obviously services growth. They, they put up good numbers for services growth basically every year, and they'll continue to do that until the government gets involved, right? And so, you know, uh, you know, looking at the valuations, can't say anything's really that crazy here. So, yeah, yeah. Growth story in the S. What's, do you have a percentage for Q2 earnings yet baked in? Yeah, not, uh, for earnings growth. Yeah, not not quite not quite yet. But over the full year, ten to eleven percent earnings growth is what we're we're penciling in. But again, this all goes number. back to the good fact number. that the U.S. consumer digits. is looking really good right now, and they're paying three point eight percent on their mortgage. That's the average effective mortgage rate, Carl. The average effective mortgage rate when the Fed had a zero interest rate policy was four point three. <laughs> so we're paying less yes. in our mortgage rate today than when the Fed had a zero interest rate policy, and that also fuels the earnings story that we're talking about, despite the valuations that Sarah was talking about. So if you're a buyer of stocks, yes. so Carl's now. like, pump it, baby. No, no, no. Um, I don't know, man. I just feel like a lot of the under $100,000 in household income uh, folks are not feeling that great still. Um, and then I feel like it's a different story if you talk about the top 10% of income earners, the top 10% of the wealthy, right? I think a lot of folks feel very good. Stocks are high. Real estate prices are still high, which is great if you own stocks and you own real estate. Uh, if you own other assets like Bitcoin, for instance, that price is extremely high so that you feel great about that. You're getting great returns in treasuries. You're getting great returns in save, high yield savings accounts. You're getting 4 or 5%. So... Yeah, it's it, the top 10%, yes, feeling great. Then you go like the next 20% of income earners, right? Uh, probably okay. But then I think the bottom, <clears throat> I think the bottom 70% <clears throat> is is not as um, good of a story, right? And you say the bottom 30 or 40% always feels bad pretty much in any situation. But it's that other, let's call it the, the middle 40% that I think is the one that's kind of getting still hurt at this point in time because of inflation. Again, you've got a tale of kind of two different markets yeah. with technology yep. far outpacing everybody else. And a lot of these, these other stocks not doing too well. First of all, the Russell's down yes. more sharply than the rest. Yep. And you have groups like Staples mm -hmm. and Energy that have underperformed significantly. Yeah. So and where do you go? Yeah, so there's a breadth story. First of all, you spoke about you spoke about the non-U.S. opportunity before. We are diversifying our overweight to equity, Sarah. We're about two-thirds in the U.S. and a third outside of the U.S. Developed markets, mm -hmm. though. So we're not quite yet jumping into the emerging story. So there is a breadth story outside of the U.S. that we think you can take advantage of. And then the other piece, we Within fixed income, we're trying to find equities that look uh, fixed income that looks like equities. So that brings back to the corporate bond story. They don't need a rate cut. Only two percent of the high yield index needs to come to, to issuance this year. Very very low. So we are we are spreading that out. And the three headed monster that people were so worried about higher rates, higher inflation, and recession. Those things seem to be moving lower. So we are we are sellers of macro volatility. I guess is what I would say. And if the market hates uncertainty, that's again fueling our overweight to risk assets. Yeah, I disagree a little bit. I think the odds of recession, in my opinion, are have gone up a little bit. Uh, in terms of higher rates, if you're talking about Fed funds rate, I think there's an ex extremely low probability the Fed would uh, raise rates, right? So I, I'll take that off the table, really. Uh, in terms of lowering rates, I feel like if this next CPI comes in, 
3-1 or under, I think that would definitely move things up. I think if we go come 3-2 or higher, I think that is still not a point in time where the Fed can really cut, and that still pushes things out to maybe the fall or the winter time in terms of when the first cut comes. So that's kind of my, my two cents in regards to all that. Okay, guys, appreciate you joining me as always. Hope you enjoyed today's video, 1000xstocks.com. That will be pinned comment down there if you're looking to apply to uh, join us in 1000xstocks.com. Much love and have a great day.